In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Glenn and Ken Aspisley. They're twins and they're co-founders of Ecamm. The company features products like Call Recorder that I use for actually this interview. Over the course of 12 years, they've sold hundreds of thousands of software and hardware products. One of the things it started with was Star Trek sounds. Listen how they did it, that and much more. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today I'm especially excited because these two guys, Glenn and Ken Aspisley, welcome guys. Hey Jeremy. Hey, Jeremy. Um, I use your software regularly on a daily basis, multiple times a day. And I just want to introduce you guys. They're the co-founders of Ecamm. Their company offers products such as Call Recorder, eyeglasses, Printopia, and many more. Over the course of more than 12 years, they've sold hundreds of thousands of software and hardware products direct to customers. They've been honored as best in show at Macworld, and most of their apps have been featured in the Macworld magazine. And I'm especially excited because we're gonna talk about how you go from that idea to making that first sale and dollar and beyond. You guys have done that multiple times over. So thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Thanks for having us on your show. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And a fun, I always like to include a fun fact because it keeps it you know, light. And a fun fact about you guys is when you were in college, you would do midnight puppet shows in the freshman dorms. <laughs> I want yeah. you to explain that for a second. Uh, that, was a, that was quite a long time ago. We're, we're quite a bit older than we look. Um, so we're talking about uh, 1996. And um, we, we uh, had to find a way to express our creativity with some friends. And um, there was a, a kind of a lounge kind of room at the end of the hallway of the freshman dorm. And we just had this idea to put on a puppet show. And I can't remember where we got the idea. But what we ended up doing was inviting people from all over campus and telling them that they had to bring a ticket. But we didn't sell any tickets or have any tickets available. Um, what you had to do was make a ticket. And so as people came into the show, they would bring their homemade handcrafted ticket with them for an inspection by the, the ticket-taking staff. And we would spend the whole day preparing um, homemade puppets and homemade sets from anything we could find available in the dorm. And uh, we'd, we'd draw a pretty good crowd of loyal followers to, um, I think it was on Wednesday nights to come see the show. Um, I haven't thought about that in a really. How did you time. even come up with that idea? Hmm. That's an excellent question. I may have to do a little research on that. But I get credit enough for finding out that you had that in the first place. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how you found that out. But um, let, me, let me think here. Where would that idea have come from? I'm just curious because I'm sure that creativity is baked into your products or maybe it comes from early on. What was, what was growing up like? Well, we always, we always had each other, that's for sure. We never really had to look very far for someone who agreed with everything that we said or, um, you know, didn't, or liked our ideas. So we kind of always, I, I think we encouraged each other to pursue ideas and projects and we always kind of had something going on um, in in thinking about um, you know questions for this interview I was thinking about our first business which actually wasn't software um, it, we actually sold rocks to other kids in elementary school on the playground um, we had a business called the rock foundation we had business cards we had order forms business cards oh yeah oh, we had business cards we were the only uh, grade schoolers with business cards and oh, wow. like, that we must have con persuaded our, our mother to let us print up, and we would uh, and we would enlist other kids as our as our employees to take orders for rocks from the other kids, um, fulfill the orders in the evening in little plastic bags, uh, labeled and distribute them the next day. Wow, this is and a serious operation you had. 
It was, and uh, lunch was 85 cents. So what we realized was that, that most kids on the playground had a dime and a nickel hanging around in their pocket, which we would easily part them with. So, uh, so do sure you get this from inspiration from your parents? What did your parents do? Hmm. I really don't think that the entrepreneurial spirit came from either of our parents. Uh, neither one of them is in business for themselves. Uh, our, our father was a chemist, and um, my mother actually has had, a, had a, a, a variety of jobs. Back then, she was actually attending recess, which may have been part of the reason we were able to get a, get away with um, selling things right. to the other kids. You didn't get kicked out. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> but anyway, um, the, the profit margin on, um, on rocks was, was pretty good. So that was actually our first profitable business. And, um, That's a good one under your belt early on. So oh, who, yeah. who was an inspiration for you with what you do now early on? The, I, I think our, 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 our first inspiration was actually um, came from one of our, one of our good friends' fathers. Um, when we were in elementary school, um, one of our fellow nerds had a computer programmer dad, and he was actually working on uh, Mac apps. I mean, way, way back when Macs were you know, just starting to get color and the ability to do things like process video, he was working on um, computer vision software. So we'd go down in his basement and he had all sorts of neat gadgets and computers and... You have to keep in mind that in the, eight, uh, in the late 80s, Macintosh computers were exceptionally expensive. I mean, we're talking ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 systems that, most, that normal people did not have access to. So if it wasn't for that experience of, of being able to get on these, these Mac 2s um, with a laser printer attached and a camera attached, um, we may not have been as fascinated with computers as we ended up being. And, it, and, it's, and it's important to remember, he was working from home in his basement. So what did he, he do? Was, what did he do then? It was, it was, he was coding. He was, he was writing, um, writing code for Mac software, um, just uh, contracting from his house. And um, There was this really hot new language coming up, C++, that he was, that he was into. And... Um, he ended up persuading our father to get us a Mac. Um, so we had a Mac SE, one of the little all-in-one guys with the um, with the built-in disk and 20 megahertz little machine with a black and white screen. And after that, we pretty much spent the whole uh, day sharing that computer, and we had that until we, for the next uh, eight or nine years until we went to college. So what did you start working on first when you, when you had your Mac? Um, back then, you got all of your software in the mail on, on disks uh, since there was no internet. And I remember we opened up a uh, disk that had just come and it had hypercard stacks on it. And this was a, a programming language that the thing that made it so different was that you could click with the option and command key held down on any button and see instantly the code behind the button. So I remember once we discovered that, we were, we were pretty much hooked. Um, mm -hmm. From then on, we pretty much just made our own programs in HyperCard um, to the point where they would get so big they wouldn't fit on a disk anymore. And, um, oh god, yeah, you had to break it up onto two disks. <laughs> that was not fun at all. But ever since then, we've been programming in uh, various ways. Uh, I remember another thing we we programmed on quite a bit was our was our graphing calculators in high school. Everyone had to get these programmable uh, TI eighty one. Yeah, I remember the TI eighty one, TI eighty two. Yeah, we discovered pretty quickly that you could program them, and the teacher thought we were plugging away on math, but we were really writing games in TI basic with the alphanumeric keypad as fast as we could. And I remember writing a, a, a video poker game Oh yeah. Uh, with graphical cards with the suits on them and you oh, discard wow. and it would add up your score. So how do you figure that stuff out? I mean, is it just intuitive or was it from the teachings of your friend's dad that kind of taught you some of the basics? Um, I wouldn't say that he taught us how to do it. It was just more of an of a inspiration. Um, but we, I would say we, we, would, we taught ourselves. I remember the first time I saw in HyperCard a repeat statement and scratching our heads trying to figure out what it was. Um, 
re repeat what was it a hyper hypercard? Repeat with i equaling zero to ten. And we said, what is this? And what is i? And just trying to figure out what it meant. <laughs> and looking back at the fact that we yeah, we were teaching ourselves. So I wanna I wanna get a rundown of what the products you guys created in order and what worked, what didn't work. And you started off, you said, with the video poker, TI eighty two. What was what was the next thing you came up with? Um uh, Oh, well, well, that would be Glenn in college. I mean, yeah, I mean, in middle school and high school, we were working on a lot of, you know, we didn't really have the intention of selling anything. We we did a lot of ga we did games. We did we really did a little bit of everything in in um, on our own. But um, it wasn't until in college, but, um, one of our computer science professors. Um, oh yeah. Someone gave him a broken Palm Pilot. It had been what happened to it? The, it, just, it just didn't turn off. The screen was. Uh, no, it wasn't. It just it didn't turn on, and Ken he gave it to Ken. Ken took it apart and put it back together, and it worked like usual. And that that <laughs> little act. Why did he give it to you? He just knew you could fix it. It was broken. I don't know why he. That's a good question. I mean, I would have thrown it out. <laughs> he knew Maybe you could he fix it. We might be interested in in seeing how it worked, but mm -hmm. as soon as we realized this thing could be pro could could uh, be programmed. Oh, I think, and I think. Um, I remember writing just some little things for it, maybe a basic Hangman game or something. Oh yeah, Hangman, you did, it, you did do you Hangman. Know, it had a black and white screen. It was a lot, internally, it was a lot like our old Mac SE, so it was kind of, it was kind of uh, what's the word, reminiscent of programming on the Mac, because you had this you know, small black and white screen, a very slow machine running uh, C, and it was kind of it was very fun to program because it was kind of old school. It was it was very Mac like inside. Right. And didn't your Hangman project get erased? I think my Hangman project got erased, and I've, I've that that was the last time I didn't make a backup of something that I made. But then um, you did well, some kind of sounds on it too, right? Yeah, well, I mean the first the first program we the first program we ever sold. So that yeah, moving was, along that was really bit. it was really kind of a boring program, right? I was in an astronomy class, and I did a little calculator program for the Palm Pilot, um, little astronomy calculation calculator, and um, sidereal you know, time. Yeah, and I kind of polished it up, and I, you know, I made a little about box, just like a real program would have, and and um, an icon. And around that time, we discovered a, an, a, 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 an app store for the Palm Pilot. It was called PilotGear.com, and um, it was really ahead of its time. You could. You could make an app, upload it, and sell it to the rest of the Palm Pilot world, and they would send you eighty percent, eighty percent of the revenue. And this, you know, sounds really familiar now. This is essentially the app store that we know today that, right. that Apple runs and Android and, and Google runs. But it's um, this was like in nineteen ninety nine. I mean, this was really early, and um, unfortunately now they do thirty percent, not twenty percent. I mean, but this was a real departure from how software was. For small uh, handmade apps were sold back then. People were still doing shareware. People were still saying, "Send me a postcard." Oh, well, people, or mail were, me still, a doll people were still mailing, mailing you a CD. I mean, the whole concept of downloading a program instead of getting a disc in the mail was was very new. And um, as a college student, it was great because I, I I uploaded this program and and the next day I had a sale. You know, someone bought my calculator and I had six dollars and forty cents in the bank. Which was a lot more than most of our college friends. So I kind of just walked around all day with this sort of like warm, fuzzy feeling, like, "Oh my God, I just, I just sold something on the internet." And then the next day, you know, someone else bought it, and someone else bought it, and before I knew it, I was corresponding with other uh, with astronomers all over the world, wanting new feature, feature requests, features, and, and time zones, and, and and everything. And it was just awesome. It was like, like, wow, this could actually be something that we could make money doing. So we just started, you know, coming up with new ideas, writing new Palm Pilot programs, and Ken, meanwhile, was doing Mac program, Mac programming. And but you have to know that back then the Mac was a mess. Um, in the mid, in the late '90s, the the blue iMac had just come out, and it was still running OS nine, and programming for it was an absolute nightmare. So I didn't end up creating anything commercially uh successful on OS9 because it was it was just too much of a mess. It, it, I, I can't even explain how bad it was. I mean, if your app crashed, you literally you had to reboot the computer. 
I don't, I don't know if you ever used OS 9, but it was, it was the, a, the dark days of the Mac. If your app crashed, you had to reboot your computer. I'll say that again. Like, <laughs> I, your computer, you'd hear the big chime sound, which we had piped, our computer piped through the, the giant speakers in our dorm room. So you would hear across the dorm, a lot like of resetting. A thousand times a day. Um, but the Palm Pilot stuff really took off because. So what other stuff did you create for the Palm Pilot? Well, well Trek Sounds was the, was the one oh, that we down in history as, as the big, the big, our first big app. Um, this, this is hacks the living daylight so out of your Palm Pilot. We, we have always, I guess you could say, been interested in, in hacks and patches and add-ons. Um, there was a tool for the Palm Pilot called Hackmaster. Oh, yeah. And it was very Master. similar to the old Sound, uh, Sound Master on OS 9, where it would let you patch traps on the system for tweaking, for, for adding little tweaks. Um, so you'd take a system routine and you'd patch it and you'd have it call your code and then back to the system routine when it was done. And Glenn patched pretty much every trap on the system. Oh god, it really, it, it was so, it was so sketchy. And played Star Trek sounds. Well, they weren't, I mean, they were, well, they were kind of just Turning little, your iPad, I, uh, little beeps and Palm Pilot and into a Star Trek pad. As you used it, it would sound exactly like you were on Star Trek. Right. So like people, maybe, maybe like tapping with the pen would be one sound, turning it off would be a sound, and it was it completely would be a sound. configurable. Um, and you could you could load sounds in from our website. We had a there was no standard sound format on there, but but we had a gallery on the website where you could download sounds and put them into the program. And people went wild over it. Um, so how popular was it? I, we, we definitely sold tens of thousands of copies of that. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, everything it, it, was $8. It got, it got to be, I mean, it was a program where if you were at, you know, we would meet people that have the program, which is kind of, you know, that kind of thing where, like, it was, it was one of those add-ons everyone wanted to get for their Palm Pilot. Um, if they were super-duper nerds, you know, you needed to have it. And it was, it, we kind of got into the, felt like we got into the software industry, you know, that we went to Palm Pilot conferences, so I, I did at least um, after college and, Really, just kept kept plugging away at that. Um, so, what was the next major project that you you took on? Let's see. I don't know how much how much how long we want to make this the uh, the saga go, but um, <laughs> we had a lot of other successful Palm Pilot apps after that, um, and we actually transitioned to selling directly to customers and not going through um, a separate store, which we have done to this day and have had really really good luck with. I mean, it's one of the the best things we ever did yeah. was was set up at, set up our own shopping cart and our um, own credit card processing um, gate uh, code through a gateway. So instead of going through Pilot Gear, you set up your own store where people can get it. Yeah, I mean, as 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 Pilot, uh, Palm Pilots and Pi um, and Pilot Gear went went the way of Palm Pilots, <laughs> um, we transitioned into um, selling on our own through PayPal. We've always accepted PayPal and credit cards directly. We've always seen about a two-thirds credit card, one-third people clicking on PayPal split. I know. How'd you decide to do that? Because most people think, well, the audience is already going to Pilot Gear. Why, you know, try and reinvent it and, and attract people on the site? How hard was it to do that to get people to your site mm -hmm. instead of going through well, Pilot Gear? Well, one motivation, of course, is we wanted to sell Mac software. We knew the Palm Pilot stuff was going away. How did um, you know that? Well, he, uh, <laughs> they, they know, Palm Pilots were never very good, thing, good devices. I feel like they, it, it was very clear that it was just kind of fading mm -hmm. away. And then when iPhones came out, it was kind of the nail in the coffin. No, they were dead long before iPhones came out. They were, yeah, they were, they never really evolved, but, but, um, it was, it was also the fact that you know you could see that most people, who found our products were were coming through search engines, and they would end up on our website, and then they would go to the other soft, the other they would go to the, um, you know, to the the ESD to buy the software. You know, for a number of years, you ha we had all the options. I remember our chart showed, Hot Pilot Gear, Handango, which was some other pil uh, similar site, PayPal, and credit card. So you were tracking it, and when you saw that the more people were searching it, then you just transitioned fully to just your website. 
Yeah. Yeah, because they were just going to pilot gear anyways to get it. But I mean, just just to be clear, I mean, like, even still, like now, if you wanted to set up a software um, business, um, one of the sort of shortcuts you can take is to use, um, like, a, a a system that lets you, you know, that will set up like a storefront for you, and take a cut. What's that one we were looking at? I can't remember the, the names, but. But I mean, you can you can you can still get a service like that. Yeah. Um, what we do is different. We we process it directly. We built our own shopping cart from scratch, um, and we pretty much use, still use the same shopping cart code that we had from ten years ago. <laughs> really? <laughs> well, I mean, it looks, all, it looks, yeah. it looks I mean, prettier, but when when we, when you're a programmer, uh, that that does, that's not all that complicated. And when you've been adding on to it and tweaking it and fixing it for ten years. Or more, it's kind of hard to go back. Right, um, you have to you have to revamp everything to. We looked at some to, third-party solution, solutions a couple of years ago. We we just weren't comfortable moving away from what had worked for so long. So then, what was the first um, Mac product, and what were some of the transition products once you started on just fully going the Mac? Well, uh, I remember working. At my old job, um, I was coding for a company, and a thing came out called called uh, uh, what was it called? Application Enhancer, and it was basically Hackmaster again, but on the Mac. It, it was. I mean, you, you could patch system traps, so you could patch a system routine. Insert your own code so you could modify existing apps. And I said, we like this. And I, I wrote a uh, just completely out of the blue. It wasn't something anybody requested or something that I thought would be particularly useful. Just almost as a proof of concept, a add-on to make iChat, which was the, well, the Mac chatting program that we pretty much lived and breathed on, uh, speak your messages using text-to-speech. And so, it was called, and it was called iChatter, which I thought was pretty cle clever. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, and then what? We, I guess we just added it to the site, you know, added it to the same system, you know, as next to all the Palm Pilot software. Same price. It was eight dollars, along with all the other Palm Pilot software. And it just started selling. And now it's not a hugely uh, useful app. But it was up there, and it was selling here and there. It wasn't uh, making a huge amount of money. But I, now I said, hey, this is a viable system. I can, we can write as many add-ons as we want to. And, and keep in mind, these are not big programs. There's very little UI. There's very little. There's no. There's no. Um, we didn't even need an icon because you're just installing an invisible plugin. Um, so simple, easy to make, easy to maintain things. So, so what was uh, the next big one? So you had iChat. Point, Apple added video conferencing to iChat. And it, it, it worked pretty well. But in a very Apple-y kind of decision, they, they, re, they required that you use an Apple camera. Um, looking back on this later, I realized it was just very Apple to say, we want this to be a good experience. We only want to, you to be able to use our camera, which we know is good. You all have a cardboard box of, of cruddy old webcams, little eyeball cameras, but they stink. And the experience is not going to be good. We can't QA them all. So we're only going to al uh, allow video, the video conference icon to show up if we detect an eyesight is attached. Yeah. It had that metal laser yeah. beam eyesight. It was like 150 bucks. 150 probably. bucks. It was this metal tube camera. There was no built in cameras yet. And this was, and, or, or, or a DV firewire camera. That was your other option. So the video conferencing feature they added would only work if you had an Apple $150 camera or a DV video cam. And the question was why? People were more than a little bit annoyed by this. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's an easy problem to solve. You know, you just find out where they're making the check to show the little, to, to turn on video conferencing, and you, and you, and you flip the answer around. And so, I made a little add-on called Geniusly iChat USB Cam. Oh, one word. Yeah, with the camel case. Right. And, um, 
that was pretty popular um, because you just clicked on it and suddenly uh, you could you could video chat. So even though I was just flipping one little switch, you I was enabling a new feature on your computer. Yeah. And we sold tens and tens of thousands of those um, add-ons, and over the years kept updating it to keep working, and and um, and it, it would it was only ten bucks, right? Yeah, and you could take any camera out of your webcam pile, any fifteen dollar, twenty dollar plastic camera, connect it to your Mac, and 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 you'd be you'd be video chatting, and it 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 turned out to be a little bit more work than just flipping the switch. After a while, we were grabbing the video, resizing it, making sure everything was working properly letting you switch your camera on the fly, letting you adjust settings on the camera. How did people and find it? They would Google, how do I make my webcam work with iChat? And our webpage would come up, or a webpage talking about our webpage. And that has been our strategy ever since, as far as people finding our software. If you want to find Call Recorder, you Google Call Recorder for Skype. Or how do I record calls? How do I record calls on, on Skype? Um, uh, if you wanted to, uh, so you're really in tune with the users. You know exactly, pretty much, what they're searching for that is going to lead them to the solution that you have. Well, turning that around, it's it's more like the products solve an actual existing problem that mm -hmm. we know people are going to have, yeah. and that we can solve for them uh, simply uh, and affordably. So yeah, that's another thing is. I find that your products are over the top affordable. So how do you decide on the pricing? Well, I, I feel like the, the reason things started out pretty cheap was because we didn't really want to feel like, I guess because maybe we just didn't really have an incredibly inflated opinion of, of the software. You know what I mean? Like, oh, well, this is just this little thing. It, 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 it's a hack. It makes your webcam work with iChat. We don't want a couple wanna... of pages of code. Like we, you know, we'll we'll charge ten dollars for this. You know, this won't be. This isn't like a big thing. Um, and the same, you know, all of our apps kind of started out that way. It's like a small thing. Yeah. Even um, apps like PhoneView, the original incarnation of it was very simple. It didn't have a lot of features, and it was fifteen dollars maybe. I think it was ten dollars. Ten dollars. It, it wasn't very much, and we added onto it over time to make it a bigger, more um, feature-rich app that we eventually raised the price of. Um, and I would, I would, I would agree with you, though. I mean, the the the, the uh, sort of the the convention in in software is usually um, if nobody's complaining about your prices, it's, it's too low. It's, uh, it's too low. Right. And no, you know, nobody complains about our well. Very rarely, so I can play to both yeah. of and um, and so you know, clearly, you know, they, we could raise them, but I feel like at thirty dollars, which is what most of our apps cost right now, mm -hmm. it's a pretty good fit with you know what people are willing to pay. Um, it doesn't make them feel like they have to you know scour the internet for some sort of you know coupon or or better deal on something right. else or pirated version. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there is that that you're, you also that's that fine line, you know. How badly does someone actually want to do this thing, and is there some sort of like really horrible free free solution? Um, hmm. Because uh, one of one of our other little uh, one of our, our other you know success techniques is coming up with something that's that's you know it, it's nice and polished and and easy to use. I mean, some of our apps, we say we have no competition for the app. And there are, I mean, meaning there are competitors, but if you download them, they're awful. Awful, <laughs> awful, awful <laughs> programs. Well, like, <laughs> once in a while, we'll see a Skype recorder come on the web. We'll get a little nervous. We'll download it and we'll just start laughing. Like, oh my god. <laughs> what? Because I, I always used to say, uh, any programmer can put an app together that that does something, but it, it takes some experience to make an app that people are going to want to shell out money for, even if it has the same functionality um, as far as usability, um, the UI, which we've never had the greatest, most beautiful UIs. 
I mean, they're pretty simple. I mean, that they're good. Sense. They're just simple. Yeah. Yeah. Like the call recorder is just pretty much a button you hit record. You know, it's right. it's pretty simple and user friendly. You know? And if you look at some some competitors, you'll open the app and the first thing you'll see is some weird question with a paragraph of text and and a bunch of buttons that none of the answers seem right. And and um, so, what are the most popular ones now that you guys have? We're looking at Call Recorder, mm -hmm. uh, Phone View, Printopia, and Eyeglasses are the top four right now. Mm -hmm. So, which one of those started? Which one was first? Eyeglasses. Eyeglasses, and then what? Phone Call Recorder. Call and Recorder. Phone View, and then. Entropia was our is our most recent hit. Um, yeah, we've also had apps that did not succeed, um, and a lot of that we can chalk up to what I was talking about earlier, where they did not meet. They were not something that people typed into Google. Um, it, they were great apps, in my opinion, but people did not search for what they did. There wasn't enough pain around them, so. Can contrast that to Call Recorder. What was one that didn't do well and you realized it didn't solve a real pain for someone? Um, I, I wrote a brilliant add-on for Apple Mail called Docstar a long time ago. And what it did was, in addition to the one little star on the, on the dock telling you how much new mail you had in your inbox, it added, a, it added four or more stars that you could assign to different mailboxes. Um, and it also sticks them up in the status bar. And I love it. People who own it love it. People who don't own it don't know about it. Because nobody types into Google, how can I, how can I get more stars right. on my doc mail icon? <laughs> and I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to sell software that people Google for than trying to convince people uh, that they want something that they don't know about yet. Um, they're both valid ways of doing things, but it really comes down to how you want to spend your time um, yeah. in marketing and trying to get people to, trying to convince people they want your, your app and that it's great and or just waiting for the people to come to you. Yeah. And we've found that the latter is, is a lot easier to uh, do. And uh, honestly, we get kind of lazy about marketing sometimes because because it's um, th those four uh, popular programs solve really specific needs that people go hunting for. Yeah. So, what are your other success tips? So you say obviously you're solving a problem that people are searching for in Google. You make the design as simple as you can. You can describe you know what it does in in one sentence. What else would you say? Uh, if a software developer is watching this, should they consider doing to have a successful and, and sell successful um, applications? Any ideas, Glenn? <laughs> Do you get these questions a lot? I mean, people asking, you know, advice. What What do you tell them? People come to us with a lot of app ideas. Yeah, and a lot of times they're, um, you know, with our twelve plus years of experience, we can look at them and pretty easily decide whether or not they fit our model of doing business. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're necessarily bad ideas in general, but as far as our lazy model of, of useful apps, uh, a clever idea that isn't necessarily useful but is a great idea just takes a very different approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the majority of app ideas that you, that you hear about these days are are kind of not like our apps. A, a lot of things, you know, revolving around crowdsourcing and social media, and and um, and really the idea of changing the user's behavior. You know, convincing the user to do something that they're currently not doing. You know, like and and when an app like that is successful, it can be extremely successful. You know, like Twitter or or um, Vine or you know some, something where. Or Foursquare, where you've just you've just introduced a totally new concept, and we get a lot of ideas pitched to us like that, and or, or we, we may also get ideas that are great ideas, but would be nearly impossible to support. 
you know, from a customer standpoint. You, you know, yeah. I would tell a software engineer looking to, to do an app, think about what you want your business to be. Um, if you are, or any business, I would say think about what, you, what skills you bring to the table. Are they the necessary skills to do what you need to do? If not, you're going to have to, and you're, you're going to have to hire people. Is another story. But since we're programmers, we have a programming business, and we can do it ourselves. Um, we want our business to be a specific vision that we have of me and Glenn and our one employee um, managing the whole thing ourselves, um, not necessarily having to work with other people, answer to deadlines, hire people, deal with the staff, have an office. Um, so you set up the company and your products kind of around how you want to form the company and your lifestyle and how you want to manage things. Exactly. And so I would tell a, a software developer looking to do something similar, before you come up with an idea for an app, think about what it's putting you on the hook for. Um, a lot of apps nowadays have to have a, have a server component. And people will say, oh, well, people will log in and I said, well, now you're now you're um, you've just committed to yourself to run it to maintaining a server right. for the rest of your life, <laughs> or for the for the lifetime of the app. You, you're you are now owner of a, of a virtual server that needs to be maintained and administrated, mm -hmm. and and when you do take when you do start to get more popular, you probably need to make it faster and what have, and it's going to get overloaded, and and now you're. Now you're dealing with having to co to, to um, get bigger servers, and, and you, it, it, it becomes uh, it can become unmanageable. Yeah, it can in grow the same into something. That, that a successful company has to start hiring more people and more engineers, and that can become not what you had originally envisioned for a business. I mean, people people listening to your story will think, okay, they got in early with the Palm and the Mac. And I know it wasn't that easy. What were some of the challenges you faced when growing your company? Hmm. We, we often, well, they're minor things, but a challenge, we, we, we always seem to be having issues with the names of our products. <laughs> the um, names? With, the, with, with, with copyright. Uh, oh, trademarks. yeah, what happened with that? Um, we have, we have several. We have a, a little folder of cease and desist letters we've re received over the years. That's true. Yeah. The, well, the first one we got was from Viacom for the Star Trek sign. <laughs> I was gonna ask about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what did they say to you? Trek sounds. The word, the prefix Trek, the communicator sound, and all of those things are apparently the trademarks of uh, of the people who own Star Trek. So we had to end up. Um, Changing the name of the of Trek sounds to Tech sounds, and this was just the first in our adventure of renaming products over the years. And I mean, it always is always kind of like a harmless, you know. There's never any sort of malicious intent. You but know, it's like, very stressful. We didn't. It usually is the kind of situation where we never expected something something to you know have any success whatsoever. Mm -hmm. As soon as you get above the radar, literally. Um, there are people at those big companies whose job it is. It's nothing personal. Right. It's their job to go out on the web once in a while and squash all of the fan sites. And um, Star Trek was notorious for this for a while. They were, you weren't even allowed to say the word Star Trek on the internet. Um, I hope nowadays they've, they've realized that's kind of not cool anymore. But so did they make you change the name. What else? Do they basically shut you down, or can you still are those no, sounds I'm, still privy I mean, to Star Trek? It was Trek sounds and uh, R2D2 sound name changed to. Um, Droid, uh, robot sound, and we just kind of had to genericize. Well, I mean, they weren't they weren't digitized sounds like you'd think of nowadays. They were just kind of like little tweets and on the on the pies. Yeah, area. I mean, they were they were sine wave collections of sine wave tones that kind of sounded similar to them. Right. So to we weren't them. infringing on the copyright of the sounds themselves. Got it. But the names of the sounds were things like uh, droid sound, and apparently droid is. Well, I'll make a long story short for one of our other naming adventures. We had iPhone Drive, um, which we just kind of wrote in a weekend. We never really expected iPhone Drive to be what it is now, Phone View, but um, it was just a little tool, for eight dollars, that let you store things on your your iPhone's disk. Um, if you wanted to use it as a dead, like a hard drive for your Mac, you could use 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 your iPhone, and, and we called it iPhone Drive. We did. It was kind of like a like a. That's stupid what it is. Yeah. We should have known that, that Apple was not going to 
let anyone use the, the word iPhone in their product name. I mean, we it just kind but of everybody just, was at the time. Yeah, iPhone, I mean, every, everything. Everyone was using the term iPhone in their product names, and, but our product kind of stuck around. And um, we did we did MacWorld Expo. Um, that put us above yeah, the radar. Yeah, we we got a booth at MacWorld Expo. <laughs> and, and you said it's yeah, as yeah, iPhone drive <laughs> walking around, and um, we got this wonderful. Um, ooh, oh God! Long report from Apple about all the many many things we were doing wrong, including using black text on a white background, which was apparently something that they Apple's trade dress. Um, so we, <laughs> we 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 thought that was kind of. Um, Hilarious. We, 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 we did not change our background color. We kind of ignored them on that one. But we changed it to, um, to f so, so we changed it to Megaphone. Megaphone. I thought that was clever. Megaphone, get it, like with a capital P. And um, we changed iChatter to, we took iChatter off the site. That was the first product. Hey, I didn't see that. That was the first product we ever killed. It wasn't selling very well anymore, and we said, and, and it has the word iChat in it, so Apple didn't want that either. So we took that off the site completely. And iChat USB Cam we renamed to iUSB Cam, which doesn't really roll off the tongue, but whatever. Yeah. So we re renamed iPhone Drive to Megaphone, and then almost immediately got an email from some guy saying, hey, my app is also named Megaphone. You need to change your na app, the name of your app. And then, like two days later, we got an, a letter from another guy saying, "My app is named Megaphone. You need to change the name of your app." So we just kind of said, "You know, you guys, you two guys should talk. Um, we're gonna go find a different name." So, so we, we settled on Phone View. And and coincidentally, I mean, even though it's really hard to think of names for that product because the telecom it crosses from from phones. Telecom and computers and iPhones, it, it's all taken. Yeah, telephones have been around since what, like the 1920s? Yeah, so Glenn is Googling around for names and he says, Phone View, we'll try Phone View. And of course, you know, Phone View, it's already an app that comes up. And he looks at it, he looks at it a little closer and he's like, Oh, this is a, a this app is like a, it's a Palm Pilot app that doesn't probably exist anymore. And then he looks at it a little cl closer, he goes, I know that guy from my Palm Pilot days. And so we just messaged him and it's like, can we use your name? Can we call our thing Phone View? And he's like, yeah, I'm not using that anymore. <laughs> and so we ended up with, I think, a better name in the end. So I guess, I guess the takeaway from these stories is, is if you are naming something in this day and age, <laughs> of, of it, you gotta, you got to spend a lot, of, a lot of time researching. And be prepared for your app name. For people to um, dispute the trademark mm -hmm. and protect your own trademarks. We find that a lot of people over fixate on the domain name. Like a lot of people are naming something, they're like, oh, I can only name my product that if the domain name is available. And we found that it doesn't matter. Nobody types domain names into the address bar. The, the domain name is so unimportant. Your domain name could be QQXXZZYZY. How'd you come up with Ecamm? <laughs> I think that was just one of those domains that we had registered back in the 90s when everyone thought that that every single domain was going to be registered by the end of the century. We just had a few handy and we, 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 named, we used the eCam domain to sell our software. It's never really changed. It. I think I was working on some kind of webcam software that, never, that I never finished. It was pretty ahead of its time. But, uh, but yeah, don't, I, I, wouldn't, I, would rec I would suggest people not to stress out over domain names. Or even company name. Nobody cares um, <laughs> if your product is good. That people don't type. People aren't typing your domain name into the address bar. They're just simply not. So your domain doesn't matter yeah, at all. They're coming through Google, and, yeah. and they don't care what your company is called. But the product name itself is important to realize that it has to be good, Googleable. I and mean, we had a we had a competitor for Printopia, which is I think the best product name we've ever come up with. And his, the competitor's product name was Fingerprint. Print, get it? With your finger because it's a phone, and this is this is clever, but what do you, what do you think happens when you Google fingerprint? I mean, it's a noun from the dictionary. You're going to find all trillion web pages that have the word fingerprint on them. Right. Um, now you might say call recorder. That sucks too. However, for some strange reason, we come up first for a search for call space recorder on Google, which I don't personally understand <laughs> how that makes any sense. So I would think one of the challenges would be, like for instance with Call Recorder, is you're developing and you're kind of subject to the third party 
software, like Skype. So every time they make a change, it's a pain in the butt. It's an interesting observation. It, 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 the, and we, we have been subject to that for since the very beginning of our company. I mean, like, like we said, we've always done hacks, is what we first called them, and add-ons. And, and, and any it's always a race against the, the software you're running on top you, of. You could actually say that all, um, most Mac developers, at least, and Apple developers, are always just kind of playing catch up with Apple. Apple's never, Apple never stops moving. They're constantly updating their software. They're constantly coming up with new things. They're constantly introducing new features that make your software not needed anymore. Um, right. And, That's also a concern. Like if they put you, something you, in you the could computer. Almost, you, could almost say that, you could almost say that that we, you know, we have to deal with that more than other developers. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you're right. a Mac developer and you've been in the market for more than a few years and and your software still uh, is useful, you're, you're pretty lucky because typically Apple will, we call it, we have a name for it in the industry, we say you got Sherlocked. But Sherlock was one of the first, uh, most memorable times that that happened. When, um, yeah, that's actually better with the, yeah, as the sun's the, changing, it's, it's like, setting. yeah. But great light in this office, but, but uh, not so great for video chats. Um, so we've never, been Sherlocked, which is this amazing fact, because so many of our friends have uh, had their entire product wiped out by either being added to the Mac or um, so the, the routine is you go to Apple's annual developer conference, WWDC. You've got your you've got your your awesome you know software, and then you let you get in the keynote to see Steve Jobs announce all the new things that Apple has been working on. And all you hold year. your breath the entire time. Yeah, and, and you're nervous, and you and you watch each slide. Like, are they going to put up a big slide that that puts me out of business? Right. <laughs> we would wait every That's time. Concerned. And we, we've and been sitting next to people in the audience that get their get like their whole program is now useless. I was sitting next to the <laughs> I was sitting next to the my friend who works for One Password, and uh, a couple of years ago. When Apple announced uh, quickly in in the new announcement for OS seven, Passbook, and I could see him. <gasps> of course, Passbook didn't turn out to be a password manager, um, but still, the, the tension was <laughs> unbelievable. You know, you could see it on the home screen, Passbook, <laughs> and uh, they did eventually add some kind of keychain management. But so, is that using foresight or is that luck or both? It's it's luck. I mean, every time a new iTunes comes out or a new iPhone comes out. We grab it as quick as we can, and we plug in the iPhone to see if Phone V still works. And half the time it doesn't, and we have to go in and um, and fix it. And we're we're always waiting for the day when we when we can't fix it. And we have had in the past had to pull uh, some individual features that were no longer possible. Um, but we've been and uh, every time a new Skype comes out, we we think is are we going to be able to fix Call Recorder or, or are we going to? You better fix it. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, actually, now, you, now that I think about it, we used to sell a webcam, uh, one of our few hardware products. Um, we partnered with another company, and we sold webcams and the associated software. And you know, Apple gradually just added cameras to all their computers. So, right. I so guess you could kind of call that you could kind of call that being gradually phased out. Yeah, I mean, it, it, a, a USB camera webcam and, and is a tough sell uh, for a Mac user nowadays because there isn't a yeah. Mac that doesn't have one unless you're on a mini. And, and eyeglasses, eyeglasses, the original reason eyeglasses was popular is because these $150 cameras that you'd buy from Apple, you'd take them home, home and the first thing you'd say when you plugged it in was, why am I so dark? Right. I need studio lighting to make myself look so right. a simple brightness adjuster was enough to sell the product. Whereas nowadays, the automatic uh, gain on these eyesights is, is, is great. And, and, and unless you've got a bright window in your background like we do in the center of the image, um, you're usually fine. We're using eyeglasses right now to to lock the to lock the camera's auto exposure, or else we would be silhouetted mm. against that. Um, I want to talk spectrum. to you guys about big turning points too, and I think that um, you know, like a lot of I guess software people, they want to do their own thing. And a big turning point for you is when you you both had full time jobs at one point, right? Right. So how how did you decide when to make that transition? It's a good question. We started, uh, I mean, when, when we graduated from college, it was 2000, and um, 
the software industry was just insanely crazy. Like, it was the if, you, if you were in a software, it was the dot com bubble. If you if you had the word computer on your resume, you know, you had a job before you even graduated. I had a company try and convince me just to like bail in March and work for them, and, <laughs> and um, so we both we, and we both you know found it fairly easy to go into you know jobs in, in cubicles. Um, and, and yeah, it was fun too. I mean, it was it was we had we went around the, we went around the building on razor scooters playing ping pong, and uh, like you see in uh, movies. But but uh, then they ask you to work on Saturday and uh, try to bribe you with some Chinese food to stay until eight on weekdays. And, and um, just like you know, Dilbert, I like to point out to people, is not fictional. It is the actual engineering industry. And at a certain point where that becomes um, a little bit of a grind. Even if your domain is fun, I was doing video editing software, he was getting to play with the latest Palm Pilots all day, and that, that makes it better. Um, it's not like we were writing uh, insurance software or something. But uh, when we started selling these Mac apps, uh, iChatter and iUSB Cam and, and iGlasses, this was during the time that I was still working full time. That we were both working full time right. at separate companies, uh, not seeing a lot of each other. And the Mac software that I had written was the majority of what we were selling at that time. And the first uh, couple of years, you know, it, it ramped up very slowly. We'd sell a couple copies a day, forty, fifty dollars a day. You're talking about. Um, maybe a thousand dollars a month. But then that just kept going up and up and up as we added apps and added in them and you know every year we benefited from the fact that Macs have become more popular. Um, our, our, our target audience grows every year. And at a certain point we realized that that I could go full time on it. Um, and that the amount of money we were making was enough that that um, it could replace my salary at um, our, my full-time job, and it's different. A lot of people think you take the dive, you quit your job, take the plunge, take the plunge, and go work on your um, new company. To me, that's kind of crazy. I'm not a huge risk taker, and um, had the benefit of being able to do both jobs. It's important to note that there are a lot of companies that don't would not actually let you sell your own software. You know, the employment agreement may say like we own anything you. Create while well, employed by us. It's a fairly standard thing nowadays. Um, Maybe we did sign that even. Mm -hmm. and we, my company, I don't know. <laughs> so why did you get to quit Ken and Glendon? It was the software. It was it was the Mac software. It was my thing at the time. Got it. Um, and I, why did you let me do that? And take that was just your idea. I don't know. I, um, it's, it was a pretty big decision. I mean, I remember um, talking to my wife and saying. I think I can go full time on, on my own company. And she's very supportive of that, but it was a little bit nerve wracking to go in and quit my job. Yeah. And my boss said, "You know, is it the money?" I said, "No, it's not the money." She said, "Is it the commute? We can be more flexible, but it's not the commute." What is it? I said, "Well, I, I'm just going to be working for myself." And she said, "Well, you know, you can always come back." <laughs> and I looked at her and said, "Well, thank you." Uh, for the vote of confidence, <laughs> and uh, you know, it never went back to the to a, a, a real job again, and that was nine years ago. Oh. So, how do you, as twins brothers, um, get along with the in the company structure, and how do you split things up? Because obviously, you were able to quit, and and Glenn is you know still working he, his full time he job. Quit the, he quit the very next year. Oh, okay. So I, I think I, I feel like Ken quit like in the fall or like early winter, and then. Like when spring started rolling around <laughs> and it was like beautiful weather outside. Well, I was, and I I was, was still like, trekking back down to my old company to, 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 to mountain bike during lunch break with my friends at the company. Oh yeah, and, and I was, then they'd go back to work and I would just go home. <laughs> and they were and I was kind of I was just stuck in an office building in, 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 in Boston. And it was pretty clear, pretty quickly like became clear that this was not sustainable. And um, and I, I liked I liked my my job. There's nothing wrong with my job. They were making me program Windows at my job, so it was a pretty easy decision <laughs> to get out of there. No, I was, I was having fun, but 
by this 2007, I think I, I just decided I would I would go full time too. And we we've always been 50/50 on uh, on our business, um, and we've always and gotten along pretty well. I would say that um, having the same DNA, literally having the same DNA, um, has is a huge advantage when you know Ken always thinks my ideas are good and vice versa. Most of the time we agree. That could be a problem though, right? Because what if the idea isn't good and you both agree with each other? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say. <laughs> are you saying that we have collective? Bad, yeah. I mean, I'm it's, saying it's, it's a possibility. Like, it's not like an echo, an echo chamber situation. Like we. We right. can still bounce ideas off each other, and, and one of us will, you know, say like, you know, that that we'll, we'll have, you know, we'll have constructive conversations. Right. But you know, we usually we're unanimous on, um, you know, the conclusion of the conversation. And we'll yeah. defer to each other's strengths and weaknesses. I mean. So what is that? Tell me about how you obviously, you know, you have the same is, DNA. How do you differ? It's mysterious. Yeah, I don't understand why we differ, or or, or how this these differences could have come up, could have come about, but um. He is way better at, at graphic designing stuff. You know, we need to make a UI, or, or someone needs to open Photoshop and, 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 and make a, a quick icon, or button, or say we need to design a flyer for a trade show, or, or, or add a graphic to the web page. Um, anything I make looks terrible, and I delete it, and he makes it instead. And it looks cool, and people ask if we had a, a graphic designer do it. Um, and, and Ken, Ken has always been more um, in like sort of low level, um, making the magic happen in the programs. Yeah. Um, so if we were to split, and that's just because I, I, you know, I did do, you know, that's just the kind of thing that comes from experience. You know, coming all the way back from the days of hacking the um, the OS nine nonsense and up through uh, making the original hacks, uh, you really have to to have an understanding of what's going on behind the scenes. And so if, if you know if call recorder breaks and someone has to go back in and start start working on figuring out how Skype has changed, um, that would be me doing that, and then just sitting back and, and waiting, hope, hoping, and maybe being the one to um, talk to customers about it, take take some phone calls. So he's more of the, I mean, chances are if a if a phone call comes in, well his his phone rings first. Um, he's the, he's more likely to be taking that call. If uh, a bug needs to be fixed in in some low level part of the code, it's more likely to be me doing it. Mm-hmm. So, do you guys st- have mentors and, or companies you look up to? Well, I mean, Apple, obviously, a big influence. You know, their whole philosophy of simple software that's easy to use and easy to explain, doesn't ask a lot of questions. I mean, we always, when, when designing our apps, we always look towards, like, you know, what would, what would Steve Jobs do is kind of like the, um, absolutely, the, the, the slogan that a lot of programmers use. And it, it's probably common to most, most developers, you know. Anyone else you look up to besides Apple and Steve Jobs philosophy? <laughs> you want something less generic? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we've pretty much, Kind of, I don't want to sound arrogant about it, but we've kind of made our own way. Mm-hmm. Um, we've been often told, you know, you're doing it wrong. We have there's a ton of things we do in our business that people think is crazy. That industry people like you know, what? What do people say is crazy? As Mac developers are a pretty small club. You know, there's you know, we get together at conferences and we'll, we'll say, are you guys, are you guys uh, still? Seriously, um, handling your customer support just via email, like you don't have a, a, a support management system yet. I'll say no, just email. Are you guys seriously not charging for upgrades? You know, all we do is work on upgrades, and that's our main revenue stream. No, no, upgrades are they're free. They're always free, and they'll say you're crazy. You're leaving so much money on the table, but. It's just you know we have our reasons for these things, and we and we don't we never do things just because other people are doing them. It's a good way to describe it. We don't we, we tend not to kind of follow the herd. Well, even up in our whole lives, outside of even our jobs, we don't we've never taken to a fad or a trend. Uh, 
at all. It's very strange, uh, unusual for an ind individual, but we just never and it changed the way I dress because other people are dressing that way. I never uh, changed my behavior because other people are, are acting. And in the same way, our company, if something works and it's working for us mm -hmm. and we have our own reasons, we don't. I don't want to make it sound like we don't take advice from people, but if certain things are working, then you just, just because everybody's doing something a certain way, everybody charges for upgrades. Yeah. I always wonder why not charge for upgrades or make call record. I'm not, not saying you do, should do this, but and why not e either, why do you keep it at a price or why do you not make it a monthly charge? How did you decide on just one set price and not, you know, like you, your we, colleagues say? We, we, we have a philosophy of, of um, you know, wanting to be a company that we would want to do business with. I, 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 just, I hate this idea of, of annoying customers. You know, like, if, you, if you think about is that annoying customers or annoying the customer? Annoying the customer. The, 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 like, 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 think of all the times you've just been like totally annoyed by a company, and like whenever that seems to be the case, I just feel like, like we just want to, if we if we can do business and just have people come away happy, and you know feel like they weren't you know. You know, overcharged or mm -hmm. uh, gouged, or um, we'll have people come and say, "I bought Call Recorder eight years ago, and these guys just gave me the latest version. I didn't even have to pay." It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it, it's amazing to them, but it doesn't cost us anything. And you know what they do? They go on Twitter and they go, "Wow, these guys are awesome!" And then, we, and then, you know, it's word of, it's all word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we would much rather have a customer using a working version, work, using the latest version of our software than having them having a broken version of our software that they paid for. Right, right. If you think about it that way, the software industry is the only industry in the world where you can sell a, a broken product and charge for the fix. Um, in any other industry, that, that would be probably uh, actionable in court. Mm -hmm. I mean, but in, and you can buy Photoshop 5 and maybe it doesn't work with 10.9 and then, and then Adobe makes you pay another several hundred dollars when they've changed their model since then, but most companies would make you pay for it again, yeah. um, and you're sitting there with customers with old, clunky, often non-functional versions of your products. Yeah. That's not a good experience. Yeah. Believe Are me, we, I'm not complaining on my end. Yeah, I mean, I'm I, leaving a little bit of money on the table, yeah. um, maybe, but at the same time, you have to look at it from a development cycle perspective. Um, a lot of our engineering uh, buddies. Uh, with similar companies, will base, you know, they'll sell some certain number of their product, sales will slow down, and they'll spend the next year on version 3.0 or something. Yeah. With the entire um, philosophy behind it being reselling that product to their existing thousand people. Right. And, and, and they're not focused on finding new customers. Mm -hmm. or, 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 uh, they're just focused on upgrades and um, I never thought that was was a good strategy. Why focus on the thousand people who have your program and not the billion people who don't? Uh, that just seems yeah. that seems a little bit. Why try to drag extra dollars out of the tiny fraction of the available market that already paid you? I mean, that just always seemed kind of like, huh? We so also let me ask you this. I have one last question for you guys, but before I ask it, I want to know what's going on lately that's exciting to you. Where Tell people where they can find out more. Uh, obviously, we talked a little bit about the site, but what are you working on now that's exciting? We, we have a number of new products in the, in the pipeline. Um, and remember, I do not edit this, so anything yeah, you cannot I mean, talk an, about. There isn't a lot that we can really like announce right now, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it, it's, it slowed down a little bit this year with uh, Printopia Pro and um, that was a big effort, and um, up some fire drills with keeping call recorder working. Um, but uh, we we've had a pretty pretty chill year as far as, as as far as new development, and we're looking now at taking some ideas we've been toying with over the past couple of years and turning them into a new product. What's um, one idea that you can give away that you're not going to use? <laughs> that we're not going to use? Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. Um, 
Hmm. So someone watching this could be like, well, I'm going to take this and, and run with it. I mean, maybe not so much of an idea, but, but think, about, think about something that you recently you know, looked for. Does this exist? You know, something that you wanted to do on your computer and, and, you, and you went to Google and you, you didn't really find anything, or maybe you found something and it was awful, um, even if it was a free awful thing. Um, and, and, and then ask yourself, can I charge money for this? Is this something someone's going to shell out money for? And if, and if the answer is yes, you know, it's, it's worth it. So right. what's something that you've seen recently that you're not going to do? That was and that there's there's so much type I mean, of product. So much software is just it's just so lousy. I'm trying to do um, a lot of stuff with um, creating um, literature for this other project I'm working on, unrelated to Ecamm. You know, creating um, uh, signage and 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 and. Um, signs and flyers and stuff and I'm sitting here in Apple Pages which is a great app but is not at all made for that kind of thing and just thinking if someone could make a a um, modern sign uh, tool for creating um, printouts and signs and flyers and banners that is um, modern and takes advantage of today's printers. Um, it could interface to um, print printing websites like uPrinting and, and VistaPrint, and, and and create output that would go directly into their their templates. That would be incredible because every every new business needs needs flyers and business cards and, and, and paper might seem a little bit outdated, but, but you know what? I mean, other other businesses rely heavily on that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I want to point out, everyone should go to ecam.com, check out all your products. It's ecamm.com. And my last question for you, Glenn and Ken, is what's the best, what's the, I guess, the greatest thing about having your own company? Because that's kind of what you set out to do, and that's what you have now. What's the greatest part about that for each of you? For, for me, I think we could sum it up by saying we don't, we don't refer to this as our job. We never say, I've got to go to work or I've got to, I've got to, I've got to go to my job. We just call it, you know, it, it's, it's, our, it's our business. You know, it's not, we never really feel like, mm. like we're working. Like, I mean, there, there have been some points where we, you know, there's drudgery involved, but for the most part, we don't feel like we're, we don't feel like we're working really. We feel like we're just having fun doing what we want to do Nobody, nobody is telling us what to do, and um, you know we can just do what we like. And yeah, I mean we've been careful to set up our business in a way that that we don't um, put ourselves on the hook for um, very much. And I know that sounds lazy, but I mean, as soon as you make a certain decision that you you have some deadline or some or some some um, somebody you have a deliverable to, you are now no longer working for yourself. I'll t I tell people I work for myself, they say, oh, do you contract? Do you, do you write code for other... And I said, no, 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 I work for myself. Or do people come to you with ideas and you... No, no, no. That would not be working for myself. Like, we work for ourselves. Like, when this interview is over, I'm going to go out to a movie with my wife, even though it's going to, you know, it, 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 I don't have something else I need to do. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's really just for ourselves. And mm -hmm. when we make business decisions, and I think it's the greatest decision we ever we ever made was not to to turn the business into something where we we were on the hook for for things from other people. Um, it's yeah. completely what we want to make it. Um, and Glenn, what now, about you? What's something that you did that you were because you have this business you were able to do? Okay. Oh, like whether it was travel or you got something you wanted or. Well, we go on tons of vacations, <laughs> and that, that's a big thing. I mean, because you could work from anywhere, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We we, yeah. we travel. I mean, we have. Um, our, my my children aren't in in school yet, so it's nice to be able. They're in um, preschool, and, and it, it's nice to just be able to go on on trips whenever you want. You mm -hmm. know, travel. You don't have to worry about. We I can work from. Um, 
you know, a little beach house, just as easy as I can work from my house. Right. Um, we do a lot of outdoor stuff in the summer. So a typical day for Ken and I might be, you know, work for a few hours in the morning and then um, grab the mountain bikes and go, um, you know, mountain bike for a few hours and then um, hit, a, hit up Starbucks and do a few more hours of work there on the laptops. Um, so, so it allows us to have this very flexible schedule. Um, yeah. And I mean, it, it, I think that applies to any anyone. Who's yeah, I mean, we, I took advantage of that, and, and when my daughter was one, uh, we packed up, we locked up our house, turned off the water, and and got an apartment in, in Paris for a couple of months, just just because we thought it would be fun. Um, and, and and I don't know what kind of job would let you do that if you if you're not working for yourself. Right. And I just worked from little French coffee shops for the, for the next couple of months. Um, well, guys, I want to be the first one to thank you so much for taking the time. I absolutely love Ecamm Call Recorder. I use it daily, like I said, and I appreciate your guys' hard work uh, into it. You know, putting that you put into it. So, thank you so much for uh, taking the time, doing the interview, and sharing some of your nuggets of success and knowledge with us. Well, thank you for the great interview. Appreciate it, guys. Yes, thanks, Jeremy. We 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 um. We love the site. We've been checking out these interviews one by one. Oh, thank you. And um, thanks for having us on. Oh, my pleasure, guys. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone, check out ecam.com. Have a good rest of your day, Jeremy. Yeah, you too.